Well, hello there. It is Christy. I've been meaning to do, or wanting to do, a video on the, the gender gap in pay and in earnings for a while. But I also know it's a really big topic, and one that deals with a lot of data, and so I want to do an extended, proper video at some point in the future. But until then, there was a newspaper, or I should say New York Times blog article that came out that I thought was important to get out there and bring some attention to in terms of understanding what things cause and drive the wage, wage gap between men and women, and also the way that that wage gap is influenced by race as well, because as we'll see in one of the links, there is a, a greater disadvantage for um, women of color than for white women. White women will earn more on average than women who come from any other ethnic background. This is why intersectionality is important, because you have to be able to see the way that these lines of discrimination intersect and aggregate the discrimination or the disadvantage which is produced. But let's get to that when it's time. Before then, I just want to review this article that was published in the New York Times related to the economy. And what the article reviews is the fact that there was some analysis done of longitudinal data, and that data was published in a journal, and I'll show you the, ar the article in just a, in a bit. But what they find is that when an industry becomes dominated by women, the salary falls. Whereas if an industry becomes dominated by men, the salary rises. Let's go ahead and have a look at the article. This is by Claire Kane Miller, and it was published on the 18th of March, and all of the things that I am going to be clicking on in this video, I will link to um, in the description box below. You can go down there and look and read at your leisure. Women's median annual earnings stubbornly remain about 20% below men's. Why is progress stalling? It may come down to this troubling reality, new research suggests. Work done by women simply isn't valued as highly. That sounds like a truism. Oops, <laughs> I touched my keyboard. That sounds like a truism, but the academic work behind it helps explain the pay gap's persistence, even as the factors long thought to have caused it disappeared. For example, women are now better educated than men have nearly as much work experience, and are equally likely to pursue many high-paying careers. No longer can the gap be dismissed with pat observations that women outnumber men in lower-paying jobs like teaching and social work. A new study from researchers at Cornell University found that the difference between the occupations and industries in which men and women work has recently become the single greatest cause of the gender pay gap accounting for more than half of it. In fact, another study shows that when women enter fields in greater numbers, pay declines for the very same jobs that men were doing before. Consider the discrepancies in job requiring similar education, responsibility, or similar skills, but divided by gender. The median earnings of information technology managers, mostly men, are 27% higher than human resource managers, mostly women, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics data. At the other end of the spectrum, janitors, usually men, earn 22% more than maids and house cleaners, usually women. And let's see, that's, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to read the whole thing out for copyright purposes, but I do want to pick up, pick up on more data that they presented. Um, there was substantial evidence that employers placed a lower value on work done by women. Quote, it's not that women are always picking lesser things in terms of skill and importance. It's just that the employers are deciding to pay it less, said Ms. England, someone who cited before in the article. A striking example is to be found in the field of recreation, working in parks or leading camps, which went from a predominantly male to female uh, from 1950 to 2000. Median hourly wages in this field declined 57 percentage points, accounting for the change in the value of the dollar, according to a complex formula used by Professor Levanen. The job of the ticket agent also went from mainly male to female during this period, and wages dropped 43 percentage points. The same thing happened when women in large numbers became designers, wages fell 37, sorry, 34 percentage points, housekeepers, wages fell 21 percentage points, and biologists, 
wages fell 18 percentage points. The reverse was true when a job attracted more men. Computer programming, for instance, used to be a relatively menial role done by women, but when male programmers began to outnumber female ones, the job began paying more and gained prestige. This is also, I thought, interesting and relevant because it's a, a scientific view of this idea that there is sexual dimorphism in social outcomes. One intriguing issue is the gender difference in non-cognitive skills. Men are often said to be more competitive and self-confident than women, and according to this logic, they might be more inclined to pursue highly competitive jobs. But Ms. Blau warned that it is impossible to separate nature from nurture, and there is evidence that non-cognitive skills like collaboration and openness to compromise are benefiting women in today's labor market. Occupations that require such skills have expanded much more than others since, the, since 1980, according to research by David Deming at Harvard University, and women seem to have taken more advantage of these opportunities than men. Still, even when women join men in the same fields, the pay gap remains. Men and women are paid differently not just when they do different jobs, but also when they do the same work. Research by Claudia God Golden, a Harvard economist, has found that a pay gap persists within occupations. Female physicians, for instance, earn 71% of what male physicians earn, and lawyers earn 82%. It happens across professions. The union that represents Dow Jones journalists announced that its female members working full-time at Dow Jones publication made 87 cents for every dollar earned by their full-time male counterparts. Certain policies have been found to help close the remaining occupational pay gap, including raising the minimum wage, since more women look, work at the lower, lowest end of the pay scale. Paid family leave helps too. And then uh, and the, the article goes on. So this is, I think, worth taking your time and reading, looking through if it's an interesting topic to you. I want to just put in some information about the links within this article. So the first one here, is the basis for the, the big claim about how when women enter a field, that field becomes paid, paid less by the employers. And it's from the uh, Oxford Journals here, Social Forces, and the abstract says, oh, the title, Occupational Feminization and Pay, Assessing Causal Dynamics Using 1950 to 2000 U.S. Census Data. The abstract reads, Occupations with a greater share of females pay less than those with a lower share, controlling for education and skill. This association is explained by two dominant views, devaluation and queuing. The former views the pay offered in an occupation to affect its female proportion due to employers' preference for men, a gendered labor queue. The latter argues that the proportion of females in an occupation affects pay owing to devaluation of work done by women. Only a few past studies have used longitudinal data which is needed to test the theories. We used fixed effects models, thus controlling for stable characteristics of occupations and U.S. Census data from 1950 to 2000. We find substantial evidence for the devaluation view but only scant evidence for the queuing view. Sadly, this is not available for free to the whole world, so if you are lucky enough to have access to the uh, Journal of Social Forces and you want to read that, you can. I'm, I'm personally locked out. I can't get into it from here, but it is available, and who knows, there might be other articles that discuss it. The other thing I wanted to show you, because it's linked from the blog, is this that these stats about male-dominated jobs are higher paying regardless of who is working in them, men or women. So this just shows you that the th 26 of the 30 jobs in the top earning decile are male-dominated, while 23 of the 30 jobs in the bottom earning decile are female-dominated. Again, this idea that when women do work it's not worth as much. Another link that was provided, and this is the Ms. Blau that they've cited here, there was this paper that is 79 pages long. If you are really interested and committed to understanding the discourse and the evidence used to talk about the gender gap or the gender wage gap, here is a really good paper for you. And I'll, I, I've looked at the abstract before and it doesn't kind of trip off the tongue, 
but um, you can go ahead and read that there and again the link will be in the description box below. Another link from the original article that I had was this one about pay gap being because of gender, not jobs. So from this article, a majority of the pay gap between men and women actually comes from differences, differences within occupations, not between them, and widens in the highest paying ones like business, law, and medicine, according to data from Claudia Golden, a Harvard University labor economist and a leading scholar on women and the economy. Rearranging women into higher paying occupations would erase just 15% of the pay gap for all workers and between 30 and 35% for college graduates, she found. The rest has something to do with something happening inside the workplace. Take doctors and surgeons. Women earn 71% of men's wages after controlling for age, race, hours, and education. Women who are financial specialists make 66% of what men in the same occupation earn, and women who are lawyers and judges make 82%. Other occupations have managed to close or even, uh, sorry, to narrow or even close the pay gap. As pharmacists, women make 91% of what men make, and as computer programmers, they make 90%. Male and female tax preparers, ad sale agents, and human resource specialists make equivalent salaries. So what's the difference? Dr. Golden sets aside much of the conventional wisdom about what makes the workplace more equitable, like anti-discrimination laws and employer revolt, and she does not emphasize the lean-in prescription involving men in domestic chores and improving women's confidence in negotiating skills. Instead, she said the trick is workplace flexibility in terms of hours and location. Quote, the gender gap in pay would be considerably reduced and might vanish altogether if firms did not have an incentive to disproportionately reward individuals who labor long hours and worked particular hours. Then this article goes on. If you're interested, again, for copyright purposes, I don't want to read the whole thing, but the evidence is clearly on the side of things other than women not going into STEM or women not going into fields that pay a lot, because even when they go into those fields, they're not making the same money, except for a few rare instances in things like human resource specialists, um, tax preparers, and ad sale agents. So we have a few in places where you've got it, and they actually have here, this might be worth zooming in on a little bit, right? And it's interesting, you know, I would, it's that dental hygienists, in my experience, Dental hygienists are women and the dentists have been men. So when men move into the dental hygienist field, they seem to make as much as their female counterparts. As we heard in the last thing about HR specialists versus investment specialists or whatever it was, women tend to dominate in the human resources departments. And when men come in, they, pay the, they get paid the same as the women. However, when you get into more traditionally masculine things like doctors and pilots and financial specialists, men are supposed to be good with money, right? Then the gap grows and grows and grows. And I'm just going to zoom in on this one more time to make sure that if you have the screen on small, you can still see it. But here it says where women fare best and worst. In many of the highest paying professions, women's salaries as a percentage of men's are lowest. And then you've got, again, from financial specialists, brokerage people, physicians, more financial advisors, dentists, accountants, lawyers and judges. And then as we get on here, we get to nurses, which is traditionally female. Psychologist has been recently disproportionately female. So you can see that it's yeah kind of interesting the way that even the equitable pay careers are gendered more toward women and men attaining equality within women dominated fields than the other way around. The last video I wanted, sorry, the last article that I wanted to present was the one that discussed the even full-time workers within the Wall Street Journal, Market Watch and Barron's are experiencing pay discrimination or an unfair, unfair pay. So this is from the Washington Post. It was published on March, March 10th, written by Daniela Paquette. And it says, 
uh, a union that the union that represents journalists at the Wall Street Journal, Market Watch, and Barrons announced this week that Dow Jones, which owns the publication, pay men more than women in jobs of similar tenure. Male staffers with up to five years of experience, for example, earn an average of 13.5% more than female staffers at the same level, and even slightly more than the category of women who've been on the job for twice as long. The Independent Association of Publishers Employees 1096 analysis found that on average, full-time women at Dow Jones properties make about 87 cents for every dollar paid to full-time men. This includes everyone employed by Dow Jones who's represented by the union. Um, da, 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 da. For comparison, now this is the bit that I also wanted to highlight about the importance of intersectionality. The Dow Jones gap, like the national gap, widens by race. Weekly pay for white women is 24% higher than for black women, while weekly pay, pay for white men is 36% higher than for black women. And uh, yeah, so that those are stats for you. That's reality. Um, we're not we're comparing like with like here, and just looking at it by sex or looking at it by race, you can have those you know studies and they're out there and they're informative. But it is important to remember that intersectionality and the way that being a woman and then being a member of an, of an ethnic background that isn't classified as white is a serious financial disadvantage for many Americans right now. It's not a hypothetical. They're, they're getting financially shafted right now. And it doesn't really take that much to pay people the same. One of the things that you can do to address the problems, well, at least for, for women, I, mean, I, think, I think racial issues are very different, but paid family leave would help. Paid sick leave. A study that I saw the other day saw that, said that um, women are 10 times more likely to, uh, stay, take their, to stay at home with their kids and take time off work, or they're far more likely to go to the doctor's office. So if a woman is getting unpaid, is not being paid because she's doing her basic good job as a mom, while the dad can go and earn, that contributes to the earnings gap. So allowing paid sick time to mothers and fathers allows them to better distribute that resource of who's going to take off of work today to stay home with little little Jimmy because, um, you know, I've got stuff at the office, you've got stuff at the office, but, you know, you can take a sick day and work from home and mom will go in and give families that flexibility. Paid vacation time. I, I know that sounds like really non-sexist stuff, but those things add up in terms of taking unpaid time off of work and women's earnings because they disproportionately take care of kids by every study that's ever been out there. Again, this is a, a hugely complicated issue, not because the ideas are complicated, but because it requires a lot of data and requires a lot of thought and looking at factors and trying to understand structures that lead to differences in, in earnings and what can be done that can fix that. And I'm a big proponent of paid family leave, paid sick leave, paid vacation time, and paid transparency. Those are my four favorite go-to solutions for addressing the gender gap, at least in the United States. But again, I want to do a larger look and an international look at how European countries fare and other Western nations and do a comparative look of how the U.S. rates against its peers in terms of providing equal financial opportunity for women in its country, regardless of their background, and men who are not white men. Basically, white men are the standard. Everybody earns relative to that. So how can we get everyone earning the same as white men? That's the question. All right. So with that, I think I'm going to wrap this up. Hope you enjoyed it. Look for all the links below. And until next time, I've been Christy. You've been awesome. We'll see you later.